Okay, I believe we are now live. Um, hello, and very welcome to the News with Pulse. I'm your host, Paul Quigley, and I am thrilled to be back in the hot seat and to be hosting Steve Salvador um, from APCO Worldwide as our guest today. Welcome to the Pulse, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Paul. I've uh, been following the Pulse series for for a while now, and it's 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 really a privilege to um, to be a part of this and and to be here with you and um, and, and the audience with us today as well. Um, and and where I'm from um, in, in Baltimore, it's a uh, perfect fall day outside. So I, it's a good day to talk about fall flavors. So I'm I'm ready Brilliant. to go. <laughs> let's 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 talk about some fall flavors and before we do I, I want to introduce you Steve but you've been following this show you know what we want to do is talk to people who are um really at the bleeding edge of using data and technology to inform communications and media strategy and their work and we want to kind of uncover the methods and how people how people are doing that and and share that with our audience and um for a little bit of background for audience uh Steve, um, before uh, becoming the Senior Director of Video and Brand Programming at APCO Worldwide, actually started in media and uh, was previously producer and editor at CNN, most recently working on the Larry King live show um, before heading over to communications side of the house. And News Whip is very much the same. We started in the world of, of media with a big client base there and have been growing increasingly in, in the world of communications. and you know, the technologies, uh, in fact, some of your colleagues back at CNN were, are, are also um, users, users of NewsWhip, interestingly. <laughs> um, so uh, let's jump right in. Daniela, our show's producer, uh, is there to triage any questions that come up. So please drop them into the comments and Steve and I will get to them um, at the end of the, of the show. And we may have a couple of other interesting things to drop into the links in the chat as well before we get to the end. So, uh, Steve, let's get right into it. Um, at APCO Worldwide, you talk about story mining and trends and use data like the kind of data that we provide for, for story mining and trends. And can you, can you uh, tell us a little bit about that and uh, tell us what is story mining first? Yeah, yeah. Well, and also too, let me, uh, thanks Paul, let me let me um, talk a little bit about what programming is too, um, because I think it, it, it certainly relates to that. Um, but first, yeah, to start APCO for, for those who don't uh, know as a, as a global uh, communications and advisory firm, we're, we're headquartered in DC and, um, and we we're, we're work with companies across many um, sectors and, and industries and, and food and beverages. Um, is, is definitely one of them. And so uh, I'm part of our in-house creative and strategy team and, and with an emphasis on video clearly uh, as well as programming, um, which, which I would define in, in the broadcast sense. You know, I think here we're talking about um, scheduled episodic streaming content and, and special features. And, and a big part of our work is, is supporting those, those creative efforts um, on behalf of brands. And in the programming realm, we're, we're creating this brand video and, and other streaming content that will sustain audience growth and, and community over, over the longer term, while, while also, of course, I think aligning with the, the business and, and reputation goals. So, you know, finding that right formula. So, you know, in my role, it's, um, it's mining for good stories and Kind of developing serialized video concepts and, and filming for, for brand owned media channels and uh, creating storytelling campaigns. And, and, and that's really at the heart um, of what I do. Uh, and Steve, this question, is, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but this is very much more on the owned side of the house in terms of communications. Uh, and, you know, it's, you're creating content that's going to be hosted on, on site by brands on the social pages and forms part of their core um, the community and identity building with their, with their audiences. Is that it? That's right. That's right. And data and media intelligence, um, undoubtedly plays a very big role in that, which I know we'll be, we talk, we'd be talking more about. Um, and, you know, as it relates to, to, um, to, to story mining, uh, and your question about, about that, that really gets to, uh, the heart of my background, um, at CNN, which you, you mentioned at the top, you know, I, I didn't start in the PR and comms field. 
Uh, my, my background in my first job out of college was at CNN and broadcast journalism, uh, where I worked for the first um, 10 years or so of my career. And coming up in that environment, you know, clearly it was, it was still audience centric. Um, you know, we had audience interests in mind. Uh, we, we had ratings to uh, evaluate our success for, for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, and there were some you know, ephemeral trends that, that would guide news coverage and that, that would guide show coverage in the moment. But, you know, a big part of the focus in the newsroom, and I think that's where, this is where story mining um, becomes applicable, uh, was, was not just on uh, timely coverage, but, you know, on, on story beats and, you know, things like in-depth reporting and, um, an exclusivity that that distinguishes your content from your peers. So, you know, I think that's that's really where you create more value. So, you know, how can our reporting, our our, our programming offer something that other networks aren't covering, um, or or they can't cover um, that the the audience will find informative and, and engaging and reliable. Um, you know, that's that was the purpose then. And then, you know, what's been so interesting about or during my time at APCO, um, working with brands, uh, is, is how much the same, the same motivations and, and the same aspirations exist, you know, especially with, with brands and, and content, the content that they um, create. And in, and in some cases, like, um, you know, like Red Bull, for example, you know, they're very much like a, a bona fide media channel. Um, so, you know, with content creation, I think part of the success rests on, um, on, on trend spotting in, in, in real time, uh, but also this this value in, in mining for for stories and you know and, and angles and hooks and these cultural levers that you know I think on a longer timeline that have bearing on your business and and, and where you can kind of really credibly report. Um, you know, there's 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 great success and there's great opportunity to be had there too. And and sometimes these stories kind of you know, lie underneath the surface and, you know, they're not immediately apparent. And I think that's where the mining comes into play and, 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 and the data uh, comes into play. Uh, we're trying to, um, yeah, it's discover pretty interesting that. To, yeah. to drill into the specifics there, Steve, sure. sorry, but like, yeah. how do you, okay. like I'm imagining this super crude, you know, because what you want to find is the stories that are interesting, but the yeah. competitors aren't picking up. So, you know, in our terms, that might be the public is interested in something, but the media hasn't picked up on it in a lot of cases yet. There's a story mm -hmm. that's bubbling up somewhere, getting some coverage, but hasn't broken out into the mainstream. Is that a story mining method or mm -hmm. or, or not? Uh, yeah, no, it is. I mean, certainly there's the, there's, there are the kind of immediate kind of things happening in the news in the moment. And mm -hmm. then there's also, you know, there are also, there are also the crowded themes out there that we'll talk a little bit more about, like sustainability or, you know, food trends, like like plant based. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's so much competition for attention there, and and, and you know, while there are these kind of hyper trends in the news, um, there's a lot to glean from. I think the longer term story trends across geographies. You know, one of the things that I think is great about Spike and analytics is, um, is, is its global reach, but also its ability to, to kind of break down patterns with interactions and, and the breadth of the data that you're getting. Um, you know, we've used it for, for food and beverage brands to, you know, see these distinct media coverage patterns about, you know, for example, like the plant-based movement, right? You know, what's really resonating in, in, in certain geographies and, you know, what, what, you know, what, what does media keep coming back to, you know, who are the, you know, protagonists and the, the antagonists in that story, mm -hmm. the compete, the competing voices. And is, is, is there a story there? So I think, you know, if interaction mm -hmm. and, and media attention equals interest and exposure, yeah. um, you know, that's really valuable data to, to have. Yeah. And there can be maybe narratives like sustainability or plant-based, but they're manifesting in different ways with different elements in different cultures and in different geographies is that it so so we want to understand the specifics of understanding specifics of sustainability in sweden might be quite different and the heroes of the story might be quite different and the things that are important and where reporters focus their attention might all be quite different from the us and you're uncovering those differences 
Right, right. That's exactly right. And 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 these a lot of these stories are global, and there are different players, and there are different policies, and different kind of priorities in different regions. So being able to kind of break that out too and understand that a little bit better, um, I, I think, can also you know go a long way in making um, ultimately the the content more effective. It's very interesting to see because a lot of cultural movements are global now, but the fact is they do manifest differently in different markets. It's a really important distinction, I think, for for communicators. Well, well let's jump over to some of those food and beverage trends a little bit, Steve. We've, we've, we've promised our audience to talk about some of those. Yeah. <clears throat> the first one, I'm not sure if we'll call it the sobriety movement. <laughs> um, what was it called back in the 20s? Um, temperance, temperance movement. Temperance but people movement. certainly seem to want to drink a bit less or to have some alternatives to alcoholic drinks. Uh, we have dry January, sober October, um, do you, have you been seeing this as, is there a bit of a mega trend going on under the surface and what are the opportunities on this for, for brands, including alcohol brands to, to connect with audiences, uh, within right. the Yes, we've definitely been seeing it, uh, the, the, the trend, um, getting bigger, I think, you know, uh, for beverage brands, um, especially, I think there's been this real consumer push towards these non-alcoholic or low alcohol beverages, which I've, I've, I've seen it described as NOLO and like some of the reporting, you know, that this is, this is definitely a trend. It is true that, you know, the data shows these bigger spikes in sobriety related content, like in, in, in dry January at the beginning of the year, um, which might not be an entirely new phenomenon, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. The, the New Year's resolutions, and then, you know, maybe you kind of kick it over to <laughs> a, 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 a month of, of, of sobriety. But, um, uh, you know, it's interesting because it's in step with just this general trend towards uh, healthier lifestyles and healthier diets, um, you know, and here, you know, I think this is a really interesting observation that the trend has actually gained momentum during this pandemic. Um, that may be surprising to some um, with, you know, when you kind of factor in the, I guess you could call it the, the complex relationship sometimes that global consumers have um, uh, when it comes to alcohol. But, you know, this NOLO trend, I, I read at the start of the year that the beverage industry was uh, anticipating the market would grow, you know, double digits upwards of like 30% by um, 2024. So, you know, clearly consumers are are interested in these options and, and you can definitely call it a, a, a sobriety movement in terms of um, how we communicate, how we communicate with, within this trend. Uh, you know, I think for, for our clients, you know, taste and quality um, are, are still very paramount um, uh, giving consumers options. I think the, uh, the market has suffered from few options and, and frankly, subpar taste, <laughs> yeah. um, especially with, with certain non-alcoholic beverages, uh, you know, consumers that may have tried them in the past, uh, many is, have had maybe bad experiences in terms of taste, uh, but also maybe flavor and, and, and quality. So brands, I think, have to build that, that trust in the market. And a, and a key theme for one of our clients in this space is, is quality and craftsmanship which is traditionally how they've um, defined their approach to the product, so to their, to their whiskeys and to their beer. Um, but now I, I think some of those same themes can really credibly apply to the, to the non-alcoholic world. So, mm-hmm. you know, what the data shows us, you know, we see this emphasis on the botanicals, on, on sourcing quality natural botanicals and herbs and, and, and the new tastes and flavors um, um, that, that, that are, are coming to market. So I think, you know, how those ingredients are sourced and harvested and, you know, putting the focus back on craft, even when the, um, even when the alcohol is absent, uh, mm-hmm. is, is what I think audiences will respond most favorably to and, and that marketers are looking, looking at and that the data um, seems to affirm as well. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear that. And that makes sense to me. The starting point isn't the drinks you, use, you, you get from a vending machine you know, people want, want, want flavorful drinks and want yeah, to continue the, the, the craftsmanship um, uh, or the sense that this is something botanical, crafted, organic mm-hmm. um, in nature. And well, let's like switching, switching gears a little bit, maybe to something that's got different geographic focus. Um, mm-hmm. Something that's come up a lot in food and beverages is how they're packaged. And, you know, I feel like there's a reckoning coming. I'm not looking forward to having to bring a load of... Um, 
bags, <laughs> I don't know, made of <laughs> cloth or something to the supermarket with me. But uh, yeah. you know, you've noticed before there's a difference in that in terms of geographic relevance. This is more of a big deal in some places or manifesting differently in some places than others in terms of the importance of biodegradable packaging, water consciousness, reusable containers, these things. What, what, what are you seeing there, Steve? Yeah, you mean just in packaging or in sustainability more broadly? Maybe sustainability more broadly, yeah. More broadly, yeah. I mean, I think... Um, you know, this is the big one. I think we all know that, you know, we're hearing a lot from brands right now about, I think there's three things of importance. There's diversity and inclusion, community building, and sustainability. And every major brand has something to say in those three areas. So, so admittedly, you know, that's, that's a crowded space. And I think, you know, really the challenge here is to acknowledge commitments to sustainability and in a, um, you know, in a tangible and in in an evocative way, uh, but also in a in a credible way, uh, and you know that I, that is really key. I mean, you you may have seen the the uptick in in allegations of companies that are greenwashing, you know, overstating their commitments. That's 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 one dashboard or, or data set you know that we we're mm-hmm. kind of looking at, and, and I think it's led on by the the fact that there's this um, there's this huge push uh, that that consumers are really demanding towards, as you mentioned, you know, sustainable sourcing and responsible packaging. Um, and so, um, you know, we try to look for these, these micro trends, not just the, 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 the macro kind of big picture stuff, but the, 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 the micro t- trends and the, 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 the geographic trends or the geographic relevance that, that, that really kind of help helps our clients wade through and, Kind of helps the story stick a little bit better because I think that's that's going to be your biggest challenge here. I think the stronger the trend, I think the more diligent you have to be um, to get an edge with the data. And you know, I'll give you an example for for the audience that kind of relates back to packaging. Right, we've seen we've seen innovation be a be a real prevalent kind of sub theme in the stories that 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 we're kind of tracking about food and beverage brands that receive high levels of engagement. Um, and I think that goes back to this tangibility, the, the, you know, these solution kind of oriented type stories that reward brands for um, taking actions and, and, and just being imaginative when it comes to the challenge. So when it comes to packaging innovations, like you say, like we're seeing, you know, you know, all these brands that, you know, are pledging commitment, you know, after commitment with target dates for, for getting this single use plastic out of the supply chain. Um, but but one of the things that we've noticed that consumers are also wanting to see are these kind of n- near term wins and you know mm-hmm. the the trailblazers or the, the the doers that are that are kind of trying to trying to take charge now and and kind of work towards that goal and um, with with one client you know it was may have been like one month or it was like a series of months where every highly engaged story on sustainability and packaging was about innovative ways to curb plastic use and yep. yeah, like seaweed pods and mushroom packaging and compostable bottles. And, you know, so, so those types of R and D type stories, I think, and the people behind them, that is a, a really good area to kind of invest in and focus on. I, you couldn't be more right there. And like maybe the perfect viral story right now is some enormous, you know, uh, innovation um, in, you know, carbon recapture, that was the idea of a 15 year old in a science project. And it's so obvious and it's perfect, but brands can do that as well. And to bring forward the heroes who are the innovators um, uh, is just such an obvious, such an obvious win, it seems based, based on the social data we see as well. Have you, like uh, Danielle had highlighted uh, our producer, you know, regenerative is potentially the next organic. Have you seen that trend coming through or, or, or made note of that. And maybe Danielle's got a link she can share on it. Yeah, I think that is one of the new trends to, to really watch out for is regenerative agriculture. And, you know, we're seeing brands like Patagonia step out and, and, and lead on this. And I think just last week, Nestle um, committed like a billion dollars to it, um, you know, paying the premiums for for uh, raw material to, to really ensure these practices can be implemented. So um, that is definitely one to look at, but again, like looking for those, the, you know, the, the, the human stories kind of behind that and, mm-hmm. you know, other aspects mm-hmm. that you can kind of find to, to, to tell that story. 
Now, I think there's more things we could do in sustainability, but we have to jump to seasonal flavors because we have nine mm-hmm. minutes left and we promised yes. some yes. seasonal flavors. We recently did our blog post all about um, uh, fall flavors. Um, and we've noticed, uh, you know, this is a nostalgic time of year, uh, mocha, uh, chocolate. Um, you've mentioned some of the classic flavors as well this time of the year. Have you seen anything for for this year that's coming through as a as a full flavor or trend in food so far. Right. Right. Well, right now I, we've, yeah, we find ourselves in this peak pumpkin spice season, which is hard to avoid that mention when, when talking about flavors, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, seeing the report, you, you put, <laughs> right. Uh, the report that you put out, which is really interesting to see maple uh, on the rise and, you know, these holiday themed berries, you know, I, I think nostalgia and comfort are a factor here in terms of what seems to just consistently be resonating. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I've been especially intrigued by some, by, by how some of the reporters and publishers cover these flavor trends, especially when it's just year after year. Um, I know we're running short on time, but there was an interesting story I saw. Um, it was from researchers at, um, at Johns Hopkins here in my hometown of Baltimore conducted a study that, that were, they were trying to explain the allure of pumpkin spice and tracing it to our, 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 our smell, the sense of smell, right. Our, our olfactory mm-hmm. perceptions more than a, than the taste. And uh, I have, I have yet to try this, but it did say like, if you, in the story, if you hold your nose, when you taste a pumpkin spice latte, <laughs> if you can't mm-hmm. see it, that people actually don't know what they're tasting. So it really just kind of gets br- drives home that point out, like, I guess nostalgia and, and smell are very correlated. And, you know, mm-hmm. that, that stood out to me as, as, as something uh, that was interesting. And, and I guess one more thing too, in the report that I, I have trouble getting behind the apple cider flavored Oreos. Um, What's wrong with those? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, I think there are two. This is just me, and again, this might be very controversial, but I I think there are too many Oreos on the market. Um, but you know, they keep they, you know they, they need keep Steve growing. Jobs to come back in and bring it back to three lines of Oreos. <laughs> yeah, no experimentation. I guess it's a good thing. Um, okay, well, let's switch gears to our to a rapid fire round where we're going to jump in on a couple of food trends uh, that the research team. Uh, here at Newsbook picked out. So what do you think, uh, Girl Scouts, the fudgy brownie filled with caramel, is this going to be a long-term keeper or, or a stinker? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think there are too many Girl Scout cookies yet. I, I don't think we've like exceeded the flavor threshold for, <laughs> for Girl <laughs> Scout cookies. Um, I remember the, the neighborhood kind of door-to-door, uh, campaigns and, and just the fact that they're not always available, you know, in, in some uh, cases. So, you know, I, I, they're, they were like the limited edition before limited edition, you know, was a thing. And, and there, I think there's an anticipation and an excitement whenever they kind of release something new. So I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Yeah. I, this, this looks a lot, this look, sometimes I complain, they look a little bit dry. This looks, this looks intriguing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, next we have uh, McDonald's launching their plant-based burgers. So here's a big shift for McDonald's. This feels inevitable. Anything you'd, you'd comment on, on, on this, Steve? This is, um, you know, this is, I think, just further validation that plant-based has, has definitely gone mainstream when McDonald's is putting out a, um, uh, a plant-based burger. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued about the taste. Uh, you know, I figure like, um, you know, a report of the week probably on YouTube will be all over this. I don't know if you've seen that channel with when it comes to fast food, but, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, plant-based getting mainstream acceptance is, um, you know, is a good thing. And it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see, though, how, how, how taste evolves, you know, on this one. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, certainly it looks like it's definitely going one way and we don't know where the the, the next uh, balance point i suppose will be between between meat and plant so okay well here's a more uh, intriguing one let's say this is uh craft partnering with uh van leuwen 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 my dutch yeah. isn't great uh, they launched mac and cheese ice cream 110,000 likes on this a lot of people are looking forward to um craft finally entering the frozen treats game what do you think? Right. Steve? Is, it, is this a, a long-term thing? <laughs> or, or? 
a novel. Yeah. Thing. You know, I wonder too, are those likes like they tried it and liked it or liked it like, oh, I, I might want to try that or <laughs> just just the, you know, the, how, how daring it actually is. Um, yeah, I, you know, this one I'm, I'm not so sure about. Uh, again, I'm, I'm here in, um, in, in, in Baltimore. I'll, I'll plug a store called um, ice cream store called the Charmery that, that puts out these like really interesting ice cream flavors. And one that they put out not too long ago was called cheese and crackers which I, is, I guess, kind of similar. Um, I, I wasn't the biggest fan, uh, but, <laughs> but I think it's another thing that's definitely going to stir up uh, engagement. I think any, any kind of you know, experimentation with, with flavors and savory ice creams or something that you might dare your, uh, your friend to eat. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, am, I am curious who comes up with these flavors and how. And, and why? I have a lot of questions about that. I think that would also be another interesting kind of avenue to pursue here. <laughs> this one feels like someone who got the idea of nostalgia cells, but I'm wondering if this is the right application of yeah. nostalgia cells. Oh, I miss, I miss mac and cheese, so I'm going to get some <laughs> mac and cheese ice cream. There may be good and a bad way to, 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 to do that trend, right? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I don't know how that will go over. So we've got a, a whole blog uh, as well in Halloween candy that Danielle's just shared. Uh, there was some intriguing new nerds flavors and things that, that, that we've uncovered that are getting a lot of engagement this year. I think people get excited about Halloween very early and start sharing things. Have you, have you seen that Steve? I did. I did get to take a, uh, take a look at that. And I, um, I think I joked in an email to you about candy corn as my least favorite candy and then I read in the Halloween candy report that candy corn is trending among brands this season with, you know, brands like, like nerds and, and red vines. And um, so, you know, I guess it shows what I know about Halloween candy. Uh, right. But uh, you know, maybe it's, it's nostalgia or maybe, you know, it's, maybe it's just that everyone loves a comeback story and, you know, candy corn, you know, at least for me was the thing that I kind of separated out from, <laughs> from the Halloween <laughs> basket, but you know, maybe we have to bring it back in now. I don't know. Maybe they, they've improved upon it. <laughs> it's candy corn, everything coming, coming this October. Right. Uh, so uh, Daniel sent um, over one question kind of that, that that's come in about the uh, being in pandemic mode. Um, do you see any innovative opportunities now we're coming out of the pandemic? There's all kinds of supply chain, quite grown up issues going on in, in, in the world. Do you see any opportunities for the food and beverage industry to respond to those and position themselves in different ways around the, you know, the serious business of coming out of a pandemic, supply chain changes, things like that? So it's kind of right. a hard question for you, Steve, for, for the last that, that six is, seconds. <laughs> that, that is a tough question in the last minute. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have seen there have been a lot of reports about supply chain issues uh, and, and in different markets. I think there are some markets that might be affected more. Um, and, and that's that's definitely something to, to watch for, especially when it comes to a lot of the, the staple ingredients as well and how brands respond. I think, you know, I, I think the, I, I would assume that a lot of the really big brands are, are keeping track of this. And I, you know, think in, in, in many ways should be you know, talking about it, um, if, if it is, if, if something that is kind of, you know, that uh, on the horizon and, and, mm -hmm. and can potentially be, um, something affecting cons consumers. Um, but I guess we'll have to see how that, that plays out. Um, there are all kinds of things that have uh, different kind of issues like that, that have come out of the pandemic that, um, it definitely is, is, is good to kind of watch, you know, keep watch over. And, and again, I think that's one of the great things about, um, uh, using data to, to, to help us do that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Steve, we're sadly already at time, and I know you might have more um, trends to share, but uh, we, we do try and keep things keep things brief for our audience. But um, yeah. it's been brilliant having you on. This has been a really fun discussion. Um, any, any last uh, thing you'd like to share with the audience, where to reach you, um, things to look out for? Yeah. Um, well, no, this, this was really fun. I enjoyed talking with you. Um, I thanks to your, your audience too, too, for listening in, um, and probably find me, you know, via all the, 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 the typical channels out there, <laughs> um, online. So, um, but yeah, really, really appreciate the opportunity, Paul. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been brilliant, Steve. And, um, 
It's very last uh, little update for everyone here. Uh, Danielle's just shared a, a link to our newest report, which is holiday food and beverages in 2021. So we're going into, uh, let's get into Q4 and look towards the end of the year and what the trends will be there. And if anyone wants that report, I, you know, uh, just reply to any of your emails from Newswhip and, we, and, we'll, and we'll get it to you or it's here in the, in the chat for the webinar today. So Steve, Salvador, thank you for joining us today. This has been brilliant. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining. We'll see you again next month for our next Pulse. Bye-bye. Okay.